All right, let's jump in here to Ezekiel chapter 19. God has laid out his case. He's exposed his heart. And now we come to that place where he says, Moreover, take up a lamentation for the princes of Israel. And really what this is, is a funeral dirge. This is where that moment of death has come. There's no more hope left, right? Uh, the doctor comes out with that gloomy look in his face and says, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. We tried. Uh, and that's kind of where we are in this whole story, is that uh, the, the death certificate has been signed, and now it's just a matter of burying the dead person. And that's pretty much what's before us is that God has tried again and again, all day long, he's reached out to a rebellious and stiff-necked nation, he's had his hands just out there saying, come back my people, and they would not. He sent prophet after prophet. Many of them, we learn from Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, that many of them died a very gruesome kind of death. We can just see a little bit of what happened to Jeremiah, though he didn't die. But he uh, was in prison a number of times. He was let down into some uh, empty and probably kind of gooey uh, cistern and kind of pretty much left there to die. He got out, thankfully, thanks to the Babylonians, in fact. Uh, so it wasn't easy to be a prophet. It was a very risky kind of job. And yet God was sending these people to be a light, to, to bring the people back. And they refused again and again and again until we get to this place where it's just, it's over. It really is. It's really over. And so now take up this lamentation for the princes of Israel. Now he's looking at the, uh, the, the house of David in particular here. And so this is a, another layer. I mean, you have the, the destruction of Jerusalem. We saw that in the last chapter, how... Uh, God said, you know, I, I found you, Jerusalem, out there. Your mother and, you know, your father, you know, mother was a Canaanite, your father was an Amorite, and I was the one who came and cleaned you off and salted you and, and wrapped you up in all this stuff, and yet you despised me and forsook me. So that was Jerusalem, the city itself. And now we're looking at the Davidic line, because remember, God had made a promise to David, that through his seed the Messiah would come, that there would never fail to be a king on the throne of David. And yet now we have this lamentation for the princes of Israel. And say, what is your mother? A lioness? She lay down among the lions, among the young lions. She nourished her cubs. She brought up one of her cubs and he became a young lion. He learned to catch prey and he devoured men. The nations also heard of him. He was trapped in their pit, and they brought him with chains to the land of Egypt. When she saw that, she waited, that her hope was lost. She took another of her cubs and made him a young lion. He roved among the lions and became a young lion. He learned to catch prey. He devoured men. He knew their desolate places and laid waste their cities. The land was, with its fullness was desolated. By the noise of his roaring, then the princes set against him from the provinces on every side and spread the net over him. He was trapped in their pit. They put him in a cage with chains and brought him to the king of Babylon. They brought him in nets that his voice should no longer be heard on the mountains of Israel. Your mother was like a vine in your bloodline, planted by the waters, fruitful and full of branches because of many waters. She had strong branches for scepters of rulers. She towered in stature above the thick branches and was seen in her height amid the dense foliage. But she was plucked up in fury. She was cast down to the ground and the east wind dried her fruit. Her strong branches were broken and withered. The fire consumed them. And now she is planted in the wilderness in a dry and thirsty land. Fire has come out from a rod of her branches and devoured her fruit so that she has no strong branch, a scepter for ruling. This is a lamentation and has become a lamentation. 
So this, this, again, the dirge is for someone who is dead, and we're looking at the, specifically the house of David. And we see here that uh, there's one, one particular ruler in the Davidic line who became lion-like, and this is talking about the king of Jehoahaz. Now before Jehoahaz, you had King Josiah. King Josiah was the last good king of Judah. And he, uh, somewhat foolishly, went out to attack King Necho II of Egypt. King Necho II was coming up from Egypt, going up to fight against uh, the Babylonians. The Babylonians were in hot pursuit of the Assyrians. The Assyrians had been routed uh, from, from their capital, uh, to Nineveh, and then from Nineveh to a place called Carchemish, and then finally they were uh, trapped, and the King Necho II was coming to, to kind of help them out. Now, not that he had any love for the Assyrians, but he didn't like the Babylonians. It's one of those classic cases that's the enemy of your enemy is your friend. And so uh, the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar II was clearly the stronger, much stronger than the Assyrians, and Necho was going to help him out. And King Josiah got the bright idea to go and to intercede uh, and to try to stop Necho II from getting there to help the Assyrians. Well, he delayed Necho long enough that by the time he got up to the, Assyri the Assyrians, it was too late, and the Babylonians had done their job, and that is the last we see of the Assyrians which is an amazing reminder that God will judge the wicked. And we think back to Jonah, how God had sent Jonah to this very, very wicked city of Nineveh. And Jonah didn't want to go. And I don't blame the guy because the Assyrians were definitely some ugly people. I mean, they did some hideous things. Uh, I mean, you know, these are the kind of guys that would... Uh, you know, make Freddy and, and the other horror guys uh, kind of like, whoa, that's really cool. Uh, some really scary stuff um, that you, you, know, you shouldn't be sh seeing in these horror movies, and yet they did this nasty stuff. Um, so I can understand why Jonah did not want to go and give them a message of hope. You're like, no, Lord, I'd rather you trash them, please. Uh, but then along comes their time of destruction, which is prophesied in the book of Nahum. And sure enough, uh, by 609, they are no more. They're gone. Uh, right about 612, actually, they are. It's the end of that. But Josiah was killed in that battle between him and, and uh, King Necho II. So his son is King Jehoiahaz. And we're told that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. You can look in... Kings 23, 31 through 34. It says, Jehoiahaz was 23 years, old when he, 23 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. Now Pharaoh Necho put him in prison at Riblah, in the land of Hamat, that he might not reign in Jerusalem. And he imposed on the land a tribute of 100 talents of silver, and a talent of gold. Then Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in place of his father Josiah, and changed his name to Jehoiakim. And Pharaoh took Jehoiahaz and went to Egypt, and he died there. So here you have uh, this young lion who uh, he rises up, he becomes a really bad guy, he only reigned three months, but he was a pretty brutal guy in those three months. And it was a very difficult time in Israel's history. And so, because he was so unruly, uh, Pharaoh Necho takes him with him back to Egypt. Well, he goes to Egypt, never to be seen again. And so, there's a time of not really sure what to do. So then, a different king rises up. And this is the king of Jehoiachim. And so he reigned for only three months as well, from, from nine, 598 to 597. And the Babylonians came and captured him, and they took him into exile in 597. 
And, you know, he did okay, actually, in Babylon. He wasn't in a prison all his life. He went there and he enjoyed a, a certain amount of, of, of respect as an exiled king. So it wasn't all bad. But still, he would have been taken away. Here you have two very important warnings. These are shots across, across the bow that God is letting the nation know, I'm trying to tell you guys something. I'm trying to tell you that your days are numbered. God said that he would protect Israel. He would protect the line of David, that there would never cease to be a king on the throne. But he said, if your son does what is evil in my sight, then I will chastise him. But of course, that he would still, the, the line of David would never be taken away. The line of David would never cease. And so here we have this uh, Jehoiachin, and, and he was also very bad. And uh, we, uh, we read about him. It says, Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. This is in 2 Kings 24, 8 through 17, by the way. His mother's name was Nehushta, this daughter of Elnatan of Jerusalem. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem. The city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city as his servants were besieging it. Then Jehoiakim, king of Judah, his mother, his servants, his princes, and his officers went out to the king of Babylon. And the king of Babylon, in the eighth year of his reign, took him prisoner. And so there he, he and all these treasures and the mighty men were carted off to Babylon. And there he, uh, he continued on. And of course, after this is when we have Zedekiah, who is going to come after him. And um, Zedekiah would be the one who would oversee the ultimate fall and destruction of Jerusalem. So as we're looking at this, this lamentation, you have the two young lions. One is taken to Egypt, never to be seen again. The other is taken to Babylon. It says they came and put a cage with chains and brought him to the king of Babylon. And so he was then taken away. And then we have this last vine but the vine, we're told, is going to be plucked up in fury. It's going to be cast to the ground. And the east wind dried her fruit. And then fire will come out of the rod of her branches and devour her fruit. So that she has no strong branch, a scepter, for ruling. And that is when Zedekiah falls. We uh, have talked about this already. Where he tried to escape down to Jericho. He was captured by Nebuchadnezzar's men. Uh, taken to Ribla, there he was judged before King Nebuchadnezzar put out his eyes, and then he was taken to Babylon, taken there, died there, but never actually got to see the land of his captivity. And so this is now a done deal. There's no more waiting, there's no more time of postponement. This is going to be a sure thing. God has decreed it, and now it will absolutely happen. And this is important when we're looking at prophecy. That, like in the days of Jonah, it says, you know, Nineveh's sin has come up against my, my nose, God says, and that, you know, it's, it's time. And so Jonah goes, he says, listen, destruction's coming. And what do they do? They repent. And they turn. But now, with this here, that time of, of repentance has already come and gone. There's a window of opportunity for the repentance until eventually God will say okay no more and that's what we see in the book of Jeremiah God says listen Jeremiah don't pray for this people anymore he said that three times it's very powerful he said because they have sacrificed their children to Baal and to Molech they worship the queen of heaven and so there is a cutoff point where God says no more as a nation it's too late I think we see this in the days of the Pharisees. When they saw all the mighty works that Jesus was doing. And what did they do? They ascribed those works to Satan. They said, oh, he's doing this healing of the sick and uh, opening of the eyes of the blind and raising of the lame. And, and they, 
the raising of the dead. He's doing it by the power of Baal Zavuv. And that's when he warned them, be careful, be careful, because you are about to sin against the Holy Spirit. Because they had the truth right in front of them. They had every evidence that they needed, and yet they would not take it. And personally, I think that that was something that could only happen in their day. That's how I read that. But nevertheless, a time comes when there is a, a cutoff point and that period is closed. And now this has happened for the kings of Judah. And so we go on now to chapter 20. It came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Have you come to inquire of me? As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Will you judge them, son of man? Will you judge them? Then make known to them the abominations of their fathers. Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, On the day when I chose Israel and raised my hand in an oath to the descendants of the house of Jacob, and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, I raised my hand in an oath to them, saying, I am the Lord your God. On that day I raised my hand in an oath to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had searched out for them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands. So what we have here is, is a series of four different snapshots of their history. Very much like what... Stephen did in Acts chapter 7 where he is there before the leadership and keep in mind it's the leadership of a country that determines the direction for good or bad of a nation though there may be many righteous people in the land but still it's the leaders that will determine the outcome there were many people in Jesus day that thought that he was the king that thought he was the Messiah and they followed him you have Nicodemus going by night, wanting to know what's the secret, Lord. And he tells him. And we see that after Jesus died, Nicodemus came with Joseph of Arimathea, and they took his body and put it in the tomb. Nicodemus obviously became a believer in Yeshua. And yet it was the leaders who rejected him and thereby brought the condemnation, the judgment that would happen in 70 AD on their nation. And the same is true with the leaders in, Israel, in Judah's day. Even though there were some righteous in the land, we're going to see that as God says, you know, I'm going to destroy both the wicked and the righteous. And yet, it was because of these wicked kings and their leaders that they were done away with. Yes. Well, it's like in Romans chapter 1 where it says that God gave them up. You know, if we, if we continue to pursue those wicked things... There's a time where God says, no, come back, don't do that, stop. You don't want to go down that path. Until eventually, you keep walking and he doesn't, he doesn't hold you back anymore. He lets you go. Well, the, the, the shvita is when you would have a cancellation of debts. But because they were so uh, debt-ridden, a, a time comes when, when God is going to require that. And it has to, there has to be sort of the balance, okay? It's just one of these kind of laws of, deep laws of the universe, if you will, where there has to be a balance, and God is going to reestablish, he's going to recalibrate things. In fact, they're taken out of the land for 70 years, what does it say in Second Chronicles? To allow the land to have the time of rest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in fact... The, yeah, in the seventh, seventh year, the fifth month, and the tenth day. Yeah, nothing is in Scripture by accident. <laughs> it's always a good, good reminder to us. Um, and so here you have, you have these leaders. Now, again, they're in Babylon. And what they're wondering is, God, what's going to happen in Judah? Because King Zedekiah has put his hope and his trust in uh, 
the Pharaoh, hoping that he will be the one who's going to save the day. But, um, and in fact, this is Pharaoh uh, Sametik II, uh, who they were hoping, and he had, he had had a victory in Egypt, or, you know, Egypt had a victory over Sudan, and uh, Israel was hoping, or Judah was hoping, that that would be the same thing that would happen for them. That he would come and he would be their, uh, their redeemer, in a sense, and save them from King Nebuchadnezzar. So they're kind of wanting to get an inside scoop. Ezekiel, tell us, what's going to happen? Is God going to, you know, is, is Pharaoh going to save the day for Judah or not? And God is rather indignant at this point. You come to inquire of me? Really? Let's have a, let's have a review. Let's, let's go back and look at our history. And I'm going to tell you why I'm not going to tell you what's, what's happening. And it's a, Right. Yeah. Yes. That's, yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Yeah, why are you going back to your old slave masters and looking to them to be your redeemer? But isn't that true? Is that, I mean, of course, this never happens in our lives, thankfully. Only to other people. Right. Uh, we, it's the dog returning to his vomit, isn't it? It's the pig going back and jumping in the mud. This is, you know, you, you get out of something and suddenly life gets challenging. You're like, well, I better go back to that old way. It's the druggie going back to drugs. It's the alcoholic going back to the alcohol. Whatever the vice, it doesn't matter. It can be very, uh, you know, very uh, classy, okay, in a sense. But it's still not putting your trust in God. It's putting your trust in man-made things, in man's wisdom, man's strength. Yeah. So he says, let's let's have a review. So you know, he, he chose Israel uh, and he wanted he wants to give them this land full of with milk and honey, the glory of all lands. Verse seven. Then I said to them, Each of you throw away the abominations which are before his eyes, and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now God says in Exodus twelve, twelve, he said and I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. The gods of Egypt were still around and kicking in these days. Right? So we're about a thousand years after the Exodus, roughly. And you still have those same gods that were doing their thing. Now these gods, ultimately, were demons. They were demons. If you go and you study, and I've studied some of the Egyptian history and religion, it's scary stuff. It's very scary stuff. And it's alive in our day as well. So what they're doing is they're looking to demons to help them on a spiritual level. These are the false gods. They're looking to the power of Egypt on a military and physical level to come and beat this other one when the very person that they should be going to is God. Had they not strayed from God, this whole question of Nebuchadnezzar never would have come up in the first place. But even so, even though it has, what is their response now? Go back to God. That's what you should always do. And I think this is such an important point for us because there's times when I have found myself you know, between the rock and the hard place, right? And what does Satan do? He comes to me and he says, you know what? You're in big trouble. I said, I know. And he says, you know what? God's not going to help you because you've got yourself in this whole mess. In your mess. I'm like, oh, that's so true. Right? I created my own mess and now I have to live in it. And, and I realized one day that I thought, well, wait a second. If the Lord Jesus was willing to die for me when I was a sinner, he was willing to give me that wonderful thing called eternal life and forgiveness. Would he not also give that to me now as his child, even though I've dug my own pit? Would he not come and help me out if I just ask him? And I realize that he will. Now, it's not to say that all the consequences of my sin are necessarily erased, because many times they're not. But we just need to go and ask him, because that is what he keeps 
asking. Listen, come, let's reason together, though your sins are like scarlet. Let's reason together. Let's, let's talk about this. You know, I know what you look like. I know you made your own mess. You think, I can't see that? But I'm still willing to talk to you and to work it out. We'll, we'll do something. I still love you, even though you've created this incredible havoc. I'll be with you, and I'll help you. And that's what God is saying to us, and that's what he was saying to them. And yet, instead of going to God and getting on their knees and saying, God, we have blown it. Like Nineveh, we deserve your judgment. Would you forgive us? We're going to weep in sackcloth and ashes for three days, hoping that maybe you'll forgive us. Rather than doing that, they would just they stiffened their neck and saying, no way, Jose, we're not going to do that. And so until eventually God comes out and says, take up a lamentation because it's over. Don't pray for them any longer because it's over. I, I, I want to stress how much grace and forbearance and patience has gone into what we're reading now because now we're getting the tail end of it. And if you only read this, this book, you might think, well, God you know, is so hasty to judge. But there have been hundreds of years of pleading with his people, working with them, trying to you know, get them on rehab, so to speak, until eventually the druggie actually goes and kills himself. That's where we're, we're really getting to. And, and, and finally God says, oh, I, I'm not going to hold back the floodwaters any longer. I've been holding them back. Your enemies have wanted to pounce on you for decades, and I've been holding them back. And now, for my own name's sake, I have to remove my hand. It's not that I'm going to kill you. I'm just going to take my hand away, and now the floodwaters come and envelop you and take you away. Satan is only all too happy to destroy Israel. He thinks it's a great day. For him, it's like, woo, this is a holiday. right? And it's only because God was holding him back and had that hedge of protection around him that they weren't destroyed earlier. Because they were not the strongest by any means. But they were protected. Until eventually God takes his hand away. And so he's, he's taken them back. You went back to these idols of Egypt. And I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and would not obey me. They did not ca all cast away their abominations which were before their eyes. Nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. And then I said, I will pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them in the middle, in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned among the Gentiles, among whom they were, in whose sight I had made myself known to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Therefore I made them go out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. More also, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Yet the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes. They despised my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they greatly defiled my Sabbaths. Then I, I said I would pour out my fury on them in the wilderness to consume them. But I acted for my name's sake, that I should not be profaned before the Gentiles in whose sight I had brought them out. So I also raised my hand in an oath to them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands, because they despised my judgments and did not walk in my statutes, but profaned my Sabbaths for their heart when after the idols. Nevertheless, my eyes spared them from destruction. I did not make an end of them in the wilderness, but I said to their children in the wilderness, Do not walk in the statutes of your fathers, nor observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God. So what we see here is, first, they rebelled against the Lord by worshiping that golden calf. That was uh, the calf that had come out of Egypt. That was the thing that God was getting them away from so that they would not worship that Apophis calf. Uh, this was just an, an awful uh, ritual that they would do. 
And yet, God was about to destroy them, and Moses interceded for the people. Don't do it, God. What will the nation say? Right? He says, okay, okay, I won't. And, oh, sure. Oh, yes. I mean, the Egyptians made a God out of everything. I kid you not. I mean, there's, you know, talk about a God on every corner. There was a God everywhere. Pardon? Well, it was probably Hathor. Hathor was the, the goddess. She was, uh, she, had, was like a, she had a very bovine face, a woman with a very bovine face. Um, and so she was you know, one of the many, many gods of Egypt. And uh, they were seeing this, this calf, or this, you know, this golden calf, or, or uh, Hathor, as being their um, their savior, rather than the <laughs> true God of heaven, who was their savior. No problem. The uh, the Apis bull, the god Apis, was also represented as a bull, and it had been worshipped in Egypt since around three thousand. BC. Uh, the Apis bull was the living image of the god Ptah, and he was also associated with Re, from whom he borrowed discs uh, he wore between his horns. And it was thought that when this bull died, the priests uh, would travel through every pasture in Egypt looking for his replacement. And um, he supposedly had the power of prophecy. And so you could see how if this God had the power of prophecy that um, they might, the, Egypt, the Israelites might have been into this God trying to say, well, what's become of Moses? What are we to do now? So they were going back and looking at that. So that's, uh, that's one possibility of what that calf was. But another is that it was the goddess Hathor who... Um, she was the cow-headed goddess, and uh, just way too many gods out there. Uh, that's why it's good to be a monotheist, because we only have one god. And that's the good thing, is that there is only one god. There's only one creator of heaven, of the heavens and earth. And so, again, here's God. He's, he's saying, listen, guys, you did all these things. You went after this stuff. And then later, when you came into the land of Canaan, you're right there. You're at the door. And I said I would go before you. I would destroy those giants. Yeah, there were giants in the land. But I said I would take care of them. And you were not willing to go in, even though I promised you that I would protect you. And so he made all the men of that generation who were 20 years old and above to wander 40 years in the wilderness until they were all gone. And so he says in verse 19, I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my judgments, and do them. Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Notwithstanding the children rebelled against me, they did not walk in my statutes, and were not careful to observe my judgments, which, if a man does, he shall live by them. Now he keeps saying that. What is God trying to say? He's trying to say that my birth, my burden is not heavy. It's easy. My yoke is light. Jesus said basically the same thing, that what I gave to you was for your good. I gave to you something that was a blessing. I told you the combination to life. You know, you ever had a padlock, and like, if I only knew the combination. You turn it this way, you turn it the other way, you turn it back again, and there's just days you couldn't get the thing open. Remember when I was in middle school, we had combination locks. And I would stress out some days because I would do it. And it just wouldn't open. <laughs> you know? Then you have to turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it until uh, you've cleared it. And then you try it again. And then finally you pull down and the thing opens. And that's really what God had given the people of Israel. He gave them the combination to life. You want to have success? You want it to open for you and have blessing? Here. Do this and do that, and don't do this and don't do that. And you'll have great blessing. And he says, if a man will do them, he'll live by them. You do these, you'll live by them. 
It's like a doctor giving you a really good prescription, saying, you know, have, you know, eat oatmeal every morning and do this. And if you do these things, you'll live. But if you don't, you won't. You'll die. And God kept telling them, do these things and you'll live. But they profaned my Sabbaths. Now, God makes a big deal about the Sabbath. In fact, we see that in the book of Isaiah. Uh, it talks about keeping the Sabbath and those who would profane the Sabbath. In fact, turn with me to the last chapter of Isaiah, 66, verse 23-24. It says, It shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath, to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. And notice what comes after this. And they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Wow. We see this, this in relation here to the Sabbath that they're going to come to God every new moon, that is every month, they're going to celebrate the feast of new moons. And they'll also come from one Sabbath to another. And they're going to worship before the Lord. And yet, he, he talks about the Sabbath again and again and how they were, they were not willing to keep the Sabbath. Now, what is the Sabbath? Well, the Sabbath is taking a day off. God wants us to rest. He wants us to have time. He wants us to spend time with, well, to not spend time with all of our gadgets, to not spend time with our work. He wants us to take a day off to be with our family. He wants us to actually sleep in and just chill out. And, of course, He wants us to be with Him. He wants us to set that day aside. And really, that's all it means is to set a day aside, to make something holy, to sanctify it. We think very, you know, holy, religious kind of language, but all it means is to set it aside, to sanctify it, to say, you know what, this day is going to be special. I'm not going to do anything else except have fun, relax, hang out with God, maybe read the Bible, play with my kids, you know, call up my parents, whatever it may be. Relax. Now, I think there's a real tendency for uh, the ultra-Orthodox Jews that they've made it a very burdensome day in some ways. Not completely, but in some ways where then you can't hit the, the button on the elevator. Mm -hmm. You're like, why is it better if I hit the button for you? How does that solve anything? I don't quite understand it. You, know, you, you can't start a fire. You can't uh, drive your car. And so it can become a burden. But it doesn't have to become a burden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, did you have a question? Okay. Uh, you know, and I think as Gentiles who've been grafted in, I, I don't know that we have a, 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 a legal obligation to keep it. I'm not sure. I'm thinking about that. But what I do see is that there's a blessing if we do keep it. There's a huge blessing. And there's a lack of blessing if we don't keep it. And... Uh, you know, we've decided to keep it in our house. We still drive, <laughs> you know, and we'll still make lunch. Uh, but the idea is, you know, to not, to spend time with the Lord, spend time with the family. Because I could be on the computer every day. <laughs> I could be checking the headlines every day. I could be in my email every day. And I begin to realize, I'm like, you know, what if I don't do it today? Am I any worse off? No. Is there, is there something so terrible that it can't wait? No. So, you know, that's where I want to enjoy that time that God has actually told me, Doug, take a day off. Okay. All right. I'll take a day off. Or if you say take a day off, I'll take a day off. And you know, I don't have to feel guilty about it. And I can say, you know, today is Shabbat. I, don't, I mean, tomorrow I should get to work. But today, I'm just going to relax. I'm under no obligation to work today. I have the day off. I mean, how would you feel 
if you were given a day off, but then your boss kept calling you back in every day. You're like, well, this isn't much of a day off. You give me a day off, but you won't expect me to be here at work. And yet just the opposite is true. God's given us a day off, and we're trying to go back and work. Right? So it's, it's not about the things uh, that we can you know, kind of go to these, these extremes to some extent. And, and of course, the whole thing about building with fire is, are you ready for it? So are you, you going to have to go out and chop wood today because I didn't get ready yesterday, which is really hard work, or no, we're, we're ready for it? Or are we just going to have a day that now nah, we're, we're ready, we're going to relax and enjoy it and take a day off? And this is really un, unheard of in the ancient world to take a day off if you were a commoner. If you're a commoner, you work every day. There's no such thing as a day off. And hence, there, there's no cycle to life. There's no time to actually to recharge, to regroup, to think, to pray. Uh, you know, they didn't have those luxuries of spending, you know, four hours in prayer every day because oh, it's going to be so wonderful. They were out working. They were in the fields. They was you know do it as you go. But now the king of the universe is saying, hey, take a day off. This stays on me. He said, really? Why? Celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Imagine if you are a, a slave owner in the South 100 years ago, 200 years ago, and you tell your slaves, hey, take a day off. And the, the day you tell them to take a day off, they're out working in the fields. You're like, what are you doing? I told you to take a day off. I mean, do you think they would really go out in the field? They'd take the day off, right? And yet God wants us to take a day off. And I think Saturday is as good as any. Take a day off. Uh, we can argue whether that was the actual day. I think it was. But that's for another discussion. So God wants us to take a day off. And he's somewhat offended if we don't. And especially offended for Israel. Because this was very specifically a sign of the covenant. This was it. This was the sign of the covenant. You know, circumcision was a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. That was the covenant God made with Abraham and his descendants before the giving of the Mosaic law. So what was the sign of the Mosaic law? Shabbat, the Sabbath. You say, we have, a, we have an agreement here? Okay, keep my Sabbath. Do we have an agreement or don't we? All right, then keep my Sabbath. And another thing about the Sabbaths would also be the, the holy days, the, uh, the festivals. Those are also known as uh, Shabbatot or Sabbaths. And that's why, incidentally, uh, when we come to the, uh, the time of the crucifixion, that uh, John tells us that it was a high Sabbath. That's what a high Sabbath is one of the holy days. It's one of the seven feast days uh, known as course Pesach which is going to happen tomorrow and uh, for us here so uh, they were not keeping those and we read in the book of Isaiah, uh, Nehemiah it says and then they kept uh, the festivals which had not been kept since the days of Joshua can you imagine they had not kept those since the days of Joshua that's pretty scary because they so quickly they came into the land and boop they stopped keeping them <laughs> So they profaned them. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yes. Right. Yeah. You know, and I think there's great blessing for us as Gentiles. If we'll keep those, they're biblical feasts. We begin to see things, even prophetically. We begin to see things that we didn't see before from the, the whole Gentile perspective. When we see it from the Jewish slash biblical perspective, like if keeping those feasts, we're like, oh, look at that. Things are happening. So, we digress. Then I said I would pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them in the wilderness. Verse 22. Nevertheless, I withdrew my hand and acted for my name's sake, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the Gentiles, in whose sight I had brought them out. I also raised my hand in an oath to those in the wilderness that I would scatter them among the Gentiles and disperse them throughout the countries. Because they had not executed my judgments, but had despised my statutes, profaned my Sabbaths, and their eyes were fixed on their father's idols. Therefore, I also gave them up to, the, to statutes, 
to, that were not good in judgments by which they could not live. And I pronounced them unclean because of their ritual gifts and that they cause all their firstborn to pass through the fire that I might make them desolate and they might know that I am the Lord God. God continues to bring this charge against them. He wants them to know, I never approved of what you were doing. And now I'm saying that's it. No more. No more. I gave you space to repent and you wouldn't. I sent my prophets for you to stop doing that and you wouldn't. What choice do I have? What choice do I have? You're killing, in, in, in a previous chapter we, we saw, he says, you're killing my children. You're killing my children. Do you get it? You're not going to kill my kids any longer. Therefore, son of man, speak to the house of Israel and say to them, thus says the Lord God, in this too your fathers have blasphemed me by being unfaithful to me. When I brought them into the land concerning which I had raised my hand in an oath to give them. And they saw all the high hills and all the thick trees. There they offered their sacrifices and provoked me with their offerings. There they also sent, set up, sent up their sweet aroma and poured out their drink offerings. Then I said to them, what is this high place to which you go? So its name is called Bama to this day. Bama is a Hebrew word and it means a stage or a, a high elevated place. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, Are you defiling yourselves in the manner of your fathers and committing harlotry among their abominations, according to their abominations? For when you offer your gifts and make your sons pass through the fire, you defile yourselves with all your idols, even to this day. So shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel? Have I, as I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of you. What you have in your mind shall never be when you say we will be like the Gentiles, like the families in other countries, serving wood and stone. As I live, says the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out, I will rule over you. Now these are the same words that God used when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And now where do they want to go for help? Back to Egypt. All right, fine. Then with an outstretched arm, I will rule over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered. With a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples. And there I will plead my case with you face to face. Now there could be something. There could be something uh, very prophetic or end times here. Uh, it could be that we have a, an illusion and I'll say it, it's only as much as that, because I don't know that it's, it's hard and fast. But could it be that he's making reference to taking them to a place in the wilderness, a place known as Petra, or Selah uh, in, the, in the Hebrew, Selah, which is the place of the stone, which is Petra. And it's believed by many prophecy teachers that they will be taken for 1,260 days into that place, and there God is going to have a little heart-to-heart -heart with them. And at the end of that time, uh, they will cry out, Baruch Haba Beshem Adonai, Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. And they'll realize their offense. They will weep and mourn. And it says that they will look unto Him whom they pierced, and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, as a, for a firstborn. They will finally look to Yeshua and they'll say, Oh no, what have we done? And then they'll say, Baruch haba, Baruch haba, blessed is he who comes. It really just means welcome in Hebrew. Welcome. That's how you say welcome to somebody. Baruch haba. Welcome. Now they're going to welcome him before they cast him out. And now they will welcome him. So this here could be a reference to that. I'm not positive, but I think it's very possible. I will make you pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. I will bring 
them out of the country where they dwell, but they shall not enter the land of Israel, then you will know that I am the Lord. Every time God gives a, a word of judgment and gloom and doom, he then gives a message of hope. Yeah, I'm going to judge you, but I'm also going to bring you under the rod, just like that shepherd does to his sheep. He brings them in, he counts them. And sometimes that rod is used for correction, sometimes it's used for comfort. But I'm going to bring you into the bond of the covenant. We'll have a new covenant. And he says, As for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, Go, serve every one of you his idols, and hereafter, if you will not obey me, but profane my holy name no more with your gifts and your idols. <laughs> okay, he's now giving them up. He's doing what he says in Romans. They went after their wicked ways, and so I gave them up. God is now giving them up. You want to do that? Fine. But don't involve me. Don't use my name. All right? Just don't say anything about me. All right? Don't bring my name into the mud. If you want to go jump in the mud, fine. But don't say that I told you to do it. For on my holy mountain, the mountain height of Israel, says the Lord God, there all the house of Israel, all of them in the land shall serve me. There I will accept them, and I will, there I will acquire your offerings and the first fruits of your sacrifices together with all your holy things. I will accept you as a sweet aroma when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will be hallowed in you before the Gentiles. Now remember that nobody is scattered at this point. They're all in the land. Well, you do have, of course, the, the ten tribes from the north that have been scattered already. So this could be already a reference to them. But in, in reference here to Judah, they're, of course, in the land. You know, some of them still. Some are in Babylon. But he has promised he's going to scatter them to the four corners of the heavens. And this has not happened yet. But it's about to. And it, it is now... We're entering here the time of the diaspora. Diaspora is a Greek word, dia, spora. Spora means to means seed, and dia means to through, basically. So it's to it's like casting seed. And this is where it's going to throw you a seed to the wind. Some here and some there. And that's certainly what we see today, that the Jews are everywhere. They're, they're everywhere. And he's going to bring them back. And so... Here again is this, this promise of hope. You're going to serve me in my land. I will be hallowed in you before the Gentiles. The world, the nations will see it as well that I have brought you back. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, in the country from which I raised my hand and oath to give to your fathers. So he's not taking it away. He's simply saying there will be a time of judgment. And this is important because there are, unfortunately, some of our brothers and sisters who believe in something called replacement theology. And replacement theology states that the church has superseded, taken the place of Israel. But all those promises given to Israel have now been fulfilled in the church. That God is done with Israel. He's finished with Israel. And I've spoken to some people, and you say, well, what about 1948, when Israel came back into the land, and there's just kind of this, this dumb look on their face, like, what are you talking about? Who cares? Because God is done with them. You know, if they want to come over to our place and play with us and eat ham sandwiches with cheese, great, and we'll talk. But as far as God having a plan for Israel, they would argue, we're done. God's done. Well, uh, I mean, certainly here, 70 A.D. especially, 135, you have the second Jewish revolt. Uh, and, and, of course, this would be tied in with the, you know, killing the Savior, so to speak. Uh, so they would see that all these point to God slash Jesus rejecting his people, and now there's a new people, uh, you know, the Gentiles that God has made them his people, that they can become the elect. And it begins to create this huge snowball 
of this one little, well, it's not little, but this, <laughs> he starts off small, is just saying that, that the church, the Gentile believers, have replaced national ethnic Israel, and it becomes this huge snowball that's avalanching down the mountain, and it just consumes us. And we have all these crazy doctrines like, uh, you know, this Calvinistic idea of election, that God chose some for salvation, the others he chose to let them be damned. And yet, that's not what the Bible says at all. Yeah, Chrysostom was uh, second century, uh, third century, 200s, and uh, a, 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 just a, an awful anti-Semite, very hostile against the Jews. Um, and look at the Holocaust, look at the pogroms. Uh, all of these are, are grounded in this idea that God has nothing to do with you guys anymore. We, the church, have taken over. Those promises were given to us. And yet God's... Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You are Christ killers and all that. And yet you see very clearly, God says in Jeremiah 31, verse 35, beautiful passage here. God says, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation forever. There, thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. Well, we haven't gotten to the furthest parts of the universe yet, so therefore God is not going to get rid of uh, the Jews. We haven't even gotten to the bottom of the oceans yet. He won't get rid of the Jews. We haven't gotten rid of the sun and the moon yet. He won't get rid of the Jews. In fact, we never get, will get rid of the sun and the moon. Incidentally, the sun and the moon are not destroyed in the age to come. They're simply ashamed compared to the light of the Lord. That's what it says. It says the sun and the moon will be ashamed in that day. Because the Lord God will be the light of Jerusalem. Yes. So it's not that they go away. They're, just, they're insignificant compared to God's light. So God will never renege on his promises to Israel. He will always, always protect them. But there will be a time, there has been a time, of chastisement. Where he's chastising whom he loves. And... I'm very grateful that I as a Gentile have gotten to be brought in to the mix. But I don't believe, because Scripture does not teach it, that I have, I and other Gentile believers have taken over. We have not taken their place. We're just here to make them jealous. And we're not doing a very good job, quite frankly. Oh. Hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Amen. Well, God's going to bring them into that land that He swore to give to their fathers. Remember, it's not because they deserved it. Moses tells the children of Israel there in Deuteronomy, don't think it's because you're so great. All right? Let's just get that straight. It's because the people in the land are so wicked. Oh, and... God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would give them and their descendants the land forever. So don't think you in this generation, don't think that you're so wonderful and that God owes you anything, because he doesn't. This is pure grace. Okay? This is the election of grace that Paul is talking about. That's it right there. So you haven't done anything to deserve it, but God is giving it to them, the Jews. And he says, and there, verse 43, and there you shall remember your ways and all your doings with which you were defiled. And you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight because of all the evils that you've committed. That's called repentance right there. They're going to say, oh, what have we done? 
And I know that we've all been in those places where we're like, what was I thinking? Why was I so evil, so wicked there? Why was I so obstinate to do that? What possessed me? I, and we can look at the situation and just loathe ourselves. I can hate myself right now for some of the things I've done in my life. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have dealt with you for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doings, O house of Israel, says the Lord God. So, right, I should just wipe you out. That's what I ought to do. But I didn't do that, God says. Furthermore, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward the south. Preach against the south and prophesy against the forest land, the south. And say to the forest of the south, Hear the word of the Lord, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will kindle a fire in you, and it shall devour every green tree and every dry tree in you. The blazing flame shall not be quenched, and all faces from the south to the north shall be scorched by it. Now, I read something like this, and having lived in Israel for three years, I'm saying, what happened? Where are all these forests that they're talking about? I have not seen them. Why? Because they're not there. But they used to be. That's the point. They used to be there. And little by little, uh, the Israelis are planting more and more trees. It's becoming beautiful. Uh, but right now, it's kind of in between. I wouldn't say it's the most beautiful land in all the world. I'd say it needs a few more trees. Uh, I love trees. I think trees are wonderful. They're very beautiful. And Israel used to be a land that was covered in trees, from what God is telling us here. And now, it's not. And because it's not, we remember the judgment. And now, it was set on fire here. When Nebuchadnezzar came in 586, he cut down a lot of trees. When the Romans came, they cut down a lot of trees. And then when Hadrian came in 135, after destroying um, Bar Kokhba and his army, he salted the land, and he changed the name of the land from Judea to Palestina. And that is when the land became really ugly. It was then, you know, if you salt the land, you can no longer raise any kind of substantial food on it. It becomes a wasteland. And that way it remained for a very long time. Well, how do you get the salt out just over... The, it would just take time. Over time, it would leach out. I mean, it's going to take a long time. I don't know how long. Maybe 1,800 years, approximately. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, eventually, you, you'll get it out. And you can plant things that, are, that will enjoy the salt. There are some, uh, some, some uh, types of plants that enjoy salt more than others. But... Yeah, I got to plant a tree when I was there, too. It's fun. I got to help. So, yes. But this word is against every green tree and every dry tree in you. It's going to be blazing. All flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. God wants to make it clear. When this thing happens, don't think that it was just some random, strange thing. I did it. I did it. I'm the one sending Nebuchadnezzar. I'm the one who is against you right now, Israel, because I am chastising you. I have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. Don't think you can go to your gods at this point or you're going to cry out to me because I'm the one sending it. I want that message to get through. Then I said, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel speaks up here, Ah, Lord God, they say of me, does he not speak parables they think that he's just you're just saying this stuff it's not really going to happen boy I hear that happening in our day lots of people have been prophesying lots of people have been spreading the gospel for the last 10, 20, 40 years or so and you start to hear people get numb to it ah oh, you guys have been talking about the return of Jesus forever it's not happening they they get numb to it. They say, oh, that's just figurative. And people in the church, he's not, it's not going to really happen that way. There's not going to really be a judgment. 
things will just go on the way they always have been. Right? Yeah, I heard right. Ooh, I yes. When they... Oh, things will just go on as they've always been since the foundation of the world. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. I was just there last week too. I was at the airport. My goodness. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, rest assured, this is no, not a parable. All that stuff that was talked about for the last days is not a parable. It's a sign of those days. The, the scoffers, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just like in. Yeah. The last days of Noah's time, right? Yes. Huh. Fascinating. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you. We, Lord, again, we, we've seen your heart. We, we want to be faithful stewards. We want to be good children. Lord, you, you're so patient with us, both on an individual level, on a national level. The whole world, Lord, you've been very, very patient. And we see the things happening in the book of Dan Ezekiel are happening in our day. Lord, help us to be bright lights, to be salt, to go out of here and to tell people. Lord, give us courage and wisdom. And, and Lord, i just thinking about a, a Jewish family I saw in the airport and I just walked on by them, Lord. Lord, I, 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 I'm sorry. I pray you'd, you'd forgive me. And next time I see someone like that, that you'd give me boldness to go up to them and to encourage them and to tell them of the hope that I have in their Messiah. We pray that that would be on our lips and that we'd practice, we'd be diligent to share that. Lord, if all these things that we see are true, then we ought to be spreading the gospel like there's no tomorrow. And Lord, I know in my own heart I get very complacent and I can start thinking it's all a big parable. As I see the sun shining today and it'll shine tomorrow too. But Lord... There, a, a day is coming when you're going to pull the plug and turn off the switch and that's it. And Lord, we pray that we would be faithful to take the gospel to everyone we meet in the meantime. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We love you. We praise you. And we pray that we would praise you with our lives, not just our lips. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.